thank you for coming. My name is Rachel Hamey, and I'm one of the senior counselors. Um, I work primarily with uh, students, seniors, letters J through Z, and so um, I'll let Mr. Fogel introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mr. Fogel, I'm another senior uh, grade level counselor. Um, thank you for coming. I went through this process a little over a year ago. Um, so the more information you have before you start this process, the better off you'll be, trust me. Yeah, I don't really need this either. But um, I just want to thank you again for coming and taking time out of your busy schedules. I know everybody, the fall seems to be really hectic. I can't believe it's already almost the end of October. I really appreciate um, Tanya McKee for coming and making time. Um, she is the Associate Director of Financial Aid at K-State. So I feel really fortunate that we have um, a contact right here in our hometown. So I'm going to let her kind of take over. So Sounds thanks. good. And do I need this one? This one's just for the room. And I, I think I can project. Yeah. OK, so awesome. One less microphone. We've, we've got this one for the recording. So. So yes, um, my name's Tanya McGee. I'm the Associate Director at the Financial Aid Office here at K-State. And so happy that we have this great connection between M MHS and just K-State. And glad you guys are here to learn all about the financial aid process. So as far as things we plan to cover tonight, um, my strategy is first maybe to talk about the different funding sources of financial aid and then to talk about the different types of financial aid and kind of marry those things up. And then of course we're gonna spend time talking about the free application for federal student aid. So that, that application that uh, you all get the joy of completing if you want federal aid. So there's four main sources of financial aid. And so you can see the different sources, federal, state, institution, and private. Um, so the federal source is, is the largest source of financial aid. And of course, those are covered um, through the completion of the FAFSA. Um, you would need to complete the FAFSA each year that you want to be considered for federal aid. So it is an application that I'm sorry, you just don't do one time. You have to do it multiple times if you want to be considered for financial aid through the, the federal. Um, there's both types of aid being need-based aid and non-need-based aid. And we'll talk a little bit later in the presentation about what that is, what's need-based aid. Um, federal aid looks mostly probably more on need compared to other sources have a combination of merit. Um, so merit, of, of course, is looking at your student and how uh, their ACT or SAT scores are, their high school GPA, um, those types of things. Maybe uh, involvement activities, um, other things uh, to be considered more than just financial resources. So, so the things that you're doing right now. Um, so the state application, um, you'll want to double check. Um, Within the state of Kansas, you're looking at the Kansas Board of Regents um, and check out their website. We'll, we'll look a little bit at it uh, a little bit later, but the state is another great place to check into sources of financial aid. So we'll look at that. Uh, institutional aid, um, of course, there's both types, merit types of aid as well as need-based aid. Um, when you're thinking institutional aid, um, it can vary from institution to institution, of course. Um, primarily, you'll, you're going to hear about scholarships. Maybe the school might have some grant programs. But some schools might have their own loan programs, too. So it just can vary from, from school to school. Um, and then private sources. Um, and this is where um, you get connected, um, perhaps doing some scholarship searches or connected through the great work resources that you have just here at MHS. Uh, I know the, the high school counselors, you have a great page where you list all the different types of scholarships that students could apply. So plug into that resource as well. Um, one of the main takeaways out of all of these different sources of financial aid is <laughs> And what I would recommend is to be organized in your search for financial aid, meaning um, if you're looking at this source to 
kind of keep a list and note when maybe a date or priority application date comes um, because as you know the senior year is gonna blow by really fast you're already halfway through the fall semester and it's just gonna go faster as as the rest of the year goes on so uh, pay attention to those dates and make sure you don't miss any dates because that's uh, could preclude you from being considered for a type of financial aid. So um, getting organized, paying attention to dates is, is really important. So the types of financial aid, and of course, um, we know about grants, we know about scholarships, uh, but there's also work study as well as the student loan programs. Um, scholarships, definitely you're gonna be looking at merit. You know, how are you doing in, in in high school. Um, definitely the money along with grants that you want to receive because it's money you don't have to pay back, right? Free money to go to school, free money to pay tuition. That's definitely what you want. Um, grants are going to look more predominantly at probably financial needs, so completing the FAFSA. Um, here's where I might add um, some, some students, uh, families will ask, I, you know, I'm not sure. Is it is it worth it to complete the FAFSA? I, I don't know if we'll get anything or I have an older son or daughter and, and they didn't uh, receive anything, meaning they didn't receive grants. Um, and I would say definitely complete it that first year. Definitely see how the application comes back um, because you, you just don't know. There's a lot of different variables in the FAFSA that um, could make a difference. So I would say try it um, because maybe maybe you can get matched up with something. Um, work study funds, um, <clears throat> those of course, those are um, more based on um, PREP's need, um, but it's funds where you can work to help pay for school. So it's a great uh, program on campus um, where uh, employers actually um, look for, maybe prefer to hire work-study students. So it can maybe give you a step up or an edge up um, as compared to maybe other uh, students uh, just because work-study is, is, um, helps uh, fund your uh, paycheck. And then of course student loans, um, it's money that you borrow uh, promising to pay that back after graduation or maybe after you're no longer a half-time student. So maybe to pull these two concepts together as far as um, the sources and the types, so looking at institutional programs, um, we've kind of talked a little bit about could be both merit and need based. Um, the FAFSA could be used to award some of that um, institutional type of aid. Uh, and again, paying attention with deadlines. Um, I know uh, besides, you know, if you're looking at uh, scholarship searches and there's a lot of different scholarships you're applying for, I know you, then you couple that up with, I'm considering a lot of different institutions and those different institutions having their own deadlines. So again, paying attention to those dates is really critical. Um, and here's where I just thought since we're in the backyard of K-State, just to throw in a little bit about K-State. Normally I don't because I like to keep the conversation uh, more just not school specific. Uh, but as far as K-State, uh, December 1st is the priority date to apply for admission. When you apply for admission, you're going to be considered for all the scholarships at K-State. And so you should get you should hear back, maybe some of you already have if you've applied to K-State, what your scholarship offer is. Um, one thing to note, um, again, we're looking at, it's merit, so we're looking at your high school GPA, maybe your uh, test scores. Um, so questions that uh, parents, students often have is, what if I take the ACT again and improve my score? As long as K-State, and this could be true for other schools, so I would encourage you to check with the other schools you're considering, as long as your scores are received at least at K-State by February 1st and that score is improved, we'll reconsider you for additional, like a, an upgrade or 
prom promote up your scholarship. Um, and the same is true even with um, seventh semester uh, transcripts. So your transcript at the end of this fall semester, if your GPA happens to tick up a point or two, send it in so we can um, use your new GPA for consideration for scholarships. So definitely uh, keep those things in mind. Uh, February 1st is that deadline as far as if, if scores should change. And then as far as another um, at K-State, if you're considering K-State, um, definitely complete uh, the K-State Scholarship Network or KSN. Um, those, um, it, it's, it's all of the endowed foundation funds where colleges and departments then may offer additional scholarships. So on top of like your centrally awarded scholarship, you may receive scholarships from the college that you're interested in. Like if it's engineering or education or health and human sciences, they also may do additional awards. So uh, don't miss out on, on that opportunity. And so uh, really here the take, the take home point really is whatever institution you're considering, it's learning what their process is, right? And unfortunately, if you're considering a lot of schools, that's a lot of information to track down and make sure you meet all those deadlines and make sure you um, cover all your bases, get all the opportunities um, explored. <clears throat> so, I think we've probably talked about this a little bit as far as institutional grants and institutional scholarships. Uh, between grants are more based on the FAFSA um, being need-based. Um, make sure you complete the FAFSA by the school's priority date. Um, December 1st, again, is K-State's. Um, I believe December 1st or even December 15th is um, the party date for a lot of schools within Kansas. But again, check their websites. Uh, they'll have that information on there. So shifting now and looking at a different source. We're looking at the source of federal and then all the different types within the federal aid programs. So of course you have federal grants. Uh, again, free money to go to school. Uh, there's several different federal grant programs. Pell Grant is probably the largest grant program. You probably have heard of Pell Grant. Um, and again, that's based on just income and the results of the FAFSA. Um, typically, um, Pell Grant could be coupled with SEOG, it's a supplemental grant. It kind of goes, marries up alongside of a Pell Grant, kind of bolsters and boosts it a little bit. So two different uh, funding sources. Um, and I will say, in financial aid, we love our acronyms. So this page is all about acronyms right now. So IASG is for, it stands for Iraq Afghanistan Service Grant. Um, so that would be for, um, uh, dependents perhaps of uh, a parent who died after 9-11 um, or a, and as a part of that conflict um, a grant for them so and then lastly teach grant and this is actually a grant that is for both undergrads and grad students uh, those uh, exploring education now granted there's um, different things um, teaching in a needed area perhaps in a specific school uh, but it's um, it's an option uh, for students pursuing education. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, we covered this thing. Uh, so work study, we talked a little bit about it already. Uh, federal work study, again, uh, is, is money that you actually earn to help with your educational expenses. So you may be wondering, so how is that different than just a regular job? It sounds like a regular job. Um, a, a couple of things make work study a, a little bit different um, in why you might want to participate in it. Um, a lot of times, um, besides having the flexibility of between, uh, maybe in between your classes popping in and, and working for a couple of hours on campus and then going to your class later, um, that convenience is often a, a positive thing too. Sometimes you can be hooked up with perhaps a uh, professor that's uh, within your field of study that you're interested in pursuing your career in. So having kind of that mentorship also uh, could be a positive too. Um, and then just as I mentioned earlier, um, having that um, 
more of that incentive for employers on campus to hire you. Um, and the reason why that is, is because Federal Work Study is actually subsidizing or paying your paycheck. So your department, who you're working for, isn't paying 100% of your paycheck. Part of the Work Study Fund is. So that's why you might look more enticing to an employer to say, but I have Work Study. So instead of spending whatever hour, you know, dollars per hour on me, it's going to be less because Work Study is going to pay part of your salary. So that's a great thing. Um, so how is it a benefit to you as a student? Um, well, how it helps you as a student is as you're completing the FAFSA, um, the FAFSA, of course, is asking how much is your total income, right? How much did you make in a year? But within that year, how much of your total income was from work study? So there's two questions on the FAFSA, right? The total income. So say you earn 5000 But there's a second question that asks, well, how much of that 5000 was work study? So if that's 2000 right, you have the two numbers there. What happens, at least right now, is uh, those things are subtracted. Instead of looking like you earn $5,000, it, it now looks like you earn 3000 right? Because work study subtracted out of the picture. That was money you earned to pay for school in the year you worked and were attending. So that's a benefit to you um, as far as looking more needy on the FAFSA later. So that's a good thing, right? We want to look more needy. <coughs> Um, and then federal direct loans. Uh, federal direct loans, th this is the largest program the federal government has, of course, is the student loan programs. Um, so this particular slide is about uh, loans students can borrow. Um, there's two different types students could be eligible for, uh, the subsidized student loan and then the unsubsidized student loan. Um, one is a need-based loan that would be subsidized and unsubsidized is not based on need. So um, the, the interest rate on the student loan is set every July 1st. So right now the interest rate, of course, as with everything, it ticked up a little bit here, probably by about two percentage points. So right now it's at 4.99. Uh, so um, this would not be your interest rate right because it's going to reset next July 1 so cross your fingers that things get fixed in the economy and the interest rate goes down so you have a better interest rate for when you might borrow um, as far as repayment on a student loan repayment begins actually either after you graduate or after you drop below half time so um, you, you really you don't have to worry about for the subsidized loan the loan would not be growing at all so let's take your first year you borrow three thousand dollars it's a subsidized student loan the government's paying the interest you're not responsible for any interest there's no interest cu accumulating um, you go through school however many years you want to go through school and then once you're finally in repayment, that's when interest would begin. So that $3,000 loan isn't growing with any interest. It stays the same uh, while you're in school. So that's a great thing. Um, now to contrast that with the unsubsidized student loan, the unsubsidized student loan is a loan that does have interest collecting from the point of disbursement. So if you receive, again, a $3,000 loan your freshman year, um, then that loan would be growing uh, with interest. Uh, you do have the option to pay interest um, if you can while you're in school, but it's, it's certainly not required. <clears throat> and I know we're like years away from repayment as far as this group of people, um, but repayment, there's definitely uh, flexible repayment options. Um, and so, um, it can tailor based on uh, your situation once you get to that repayment stage. And now to shift and look now at uh, those are students, uh, student loans, and then there are there is the option for the parent to borrow uh, a loan to help with the student's educational expenses. Um, so the Parent PLUS loan would be available to students. Um, there is a credit check that's performed on the parent who would be borrowing. Um, so if by chance the, the credit check um, comes back where uh, it's adverse credit history, 
what would and so then you're not eligible to borrow the plus loan to help your student what would happen is then uh, more unsubsidized student loans would be offered to the student um, on the plus loan repayments a little bit different you enter into repayment earlier than like the students do the students are like once you're done with school that's when you enter into repayment on the plus loan you enter into repayment actually uh, it's 60 days after the loan is fully dispersed so fully dispersed you have a fall disbursement you have a spring disbursement the loans fully dispersed so that would be like March April is when that would begin to go into repayment uh, you do have the option if you happen to borrow the parent plus loan to defer um, repayment similar to the the, the student loan uh, you would just need to work with your servicer your loan servicer to request that um, the parent plus loan is similar to the unsubsidized loan in that it's it does have interest collecting from the point of disbursement and you can see the interest rate there uh, for the parent plus loan um, one thing I might add um, just because as parents you're trying to piece together the puzzle perhaps and and maybe uh, you're the parent who's like well, I really don't want my student to have perhaps a lot of debt um, I'll take out the plus loan so I, I've seen some parents um, do this and my recommendation to that parent would be this has a higher interest rate compared to what we just saw 4.99 on the student loans let the student borrow their loan you can certainly help them repay it get the lower interest rate help your student gain credit worthiness because you're helping pay back the loan uh, and ju it's just a better um, financial financial path So that was a whirlwind, a whirlwind look at the federal aid programs. Um, now looking quickly at state aid programs. As I mentioned, the Kansas Board of Regents is the place. Uh, definitely check out their website. This website uh, listed on the slide brings you directly to their application. Um, but I, what I, what I normally do is I just Google it, right? Kansas Board of Regents Financial Aid, and pull it up. Um, that way you can get uh, see on their website more description about the different aid programs so here's a list of some of the uh, financial aid options um, offered through the state um, we have uh, several students who qualify for the Kansas State Scholarship um, that is a particular scholarship where you complete the Regents recommended curriculum um, it, it's four years of English see here right here these people know this the best right the four years of English there's uh, four years of math as well three of science two of your foreign language and it has to be consecutive you know French one French two and then there's something else I probably forgot but uh, so yeah I didn't say and so if you complete that these folks you guys work hard to determine okay who's met that curriculum and you send the names into the state to say here's our state scholars um, so with that you might be eligible to um, get this scholarship it's pretty um, they look at probably high ACT um, scores as well but um, definitely one to check into it's a thousand dollars a year for and it's renewable for up to four years um, similarly the Kansas et ethnic minority uh, is a renewable scholarship as well um, that dollar amount is 1850 per year um, and then they have other uh, scholarship programs uh, the teacher service and nursing uh, and military service um, those have a service component which means um, um, it's a scholarship and you're promising to work in the state of Kansas in the teaching nursing field and then at the very bottom the hero scholarship would be for dependents uh, whose um, parent had passed away uh, while they were serving in public service uh, and military personnel so those are the scholarship programs here's some of the state grant programs um, institutions uh, received from the Kansas Board of Regents um, funds um, specifically the Kansas Comprehensive Grant um, and some other um, 
programs. And so institutions then also award these funds out uh, from the state. So here's, here's the takeaway. How do I qualify for some of these? It's still completing the FAFSA and making sure you complete the FAFSA by the state's priority date. The state has a really late priority date of like April 1, May 1, I think. So if you complete your FAFSA by December 1, you got it covered. And then private aid. So this is a lot of times you're thinking about uh, those private scholarship searches that you can do. Um, maybe looking at um, within the community, there's different foundations or organizations uh, that you can uh, apply to. I know those are probably a lot of things that you have listed on your website. Um, where you work might have uh, an educational, uh, like a dependent uh, tuition assistance program. Um, at K-State, um, seven credit hours per semester um, can be um, received as a dependent spouse grant. Um, so that's something to check into. Um, this, this again ties back to do, starting to organize, make notes, keep track of all those details. Um, here's some of the different websites. There's definitely a bunch out there. Um, when I was preparing for uh, this presentation a few weeks ago, that's one of the things I do online. What is the best? Who are the best scholarship online searches? And these things still pop up kind of year after year. Um, so check into those. Um, it, it takes some work. I, I'll tell you, um, here's a great success story. Um, so this past June, um, working K-State's orientation enrollment uh, and a student's coming and he's telling, providing information to our office, listing all the different scholarships he's receiving. And it, it's scholarship after scholarship after scholarship. And I'm like, wow, like that, that is a rarity. But I told him, I'm like, I need one. I need you to be on my panel for <laughs> a conversation like this. But then I said to him, you must have worked really hard to get all these scholarships. Like you put in the work and you applied and you kept applying and you kept putting your name out there. And so, yes, it, it is work, but it's, it's work um, that has big payoffs. It had great payoffs for him in the end. Um, everything was covered, like everything, tuition, housing, like there was no need for any loans because he had enough of all the other scholarships and things. So, but, but it does take time. Um, you'll, you'll hear people talk about, um, you know, if you're working right now as a student and you're making, if you're lucky, you're making $15 an hour, right? Maybe 12, I don't know, <laughs> nine, I don't know, <laughs> whatever you're making. Um, but do put in the time because if you spend the two hours to work on that essay that nobody wants to write, that maybe you're one of five students who do put in the time to apply for that scholarship, you might receive that scholarship. So two hours of your time and you win $250, $500, $1,000, divide that over the number of hours, wow, yeah, that's a, a pretty good per hourly rate. Um, so, and I, to be honest, so I have a junior, so I know I'm preaching to the choir. So um, we hope she puts in the time too to take the effort and do all those things. All, all of them are pretty good. And I would even check out um, Scholarship America is another one um, that we see a lot of um, scholarships coming from that organization. I think they're probably um, work with different entities and all their scholarships kind of throw, th they manage it, I think. Um, I know FastWeb has is, is been out there for a long time, but I think they maybe provide a lot, maybe overwhelms, I don't know. Rachel, were you gonna suggest? No, I was just gonna say, what do you think about paying for a search? Do you recommend paying for one or are these free? So the question is, would, would you recommend paying for a search engine, um, these are all free. So I probably wouldn't pay for uh, that service because there's plenty of free search engines out there. Um, as well as just to couple that with uh, paying someone to help you complete the FAFSA, um, that's, that's what I'm for. 
right? That's what I'm getting paid to do. So talk to your school's financial aid office. If you have questions about the FAFSA, give us a, give us a call, talk to your financial aid administrator. We're, we're here to help you with that, definitely. That didn't answer your question at all, though, did it? <laughs> but um, I think any of them are probably good. Um, it, it, and each can probably provide different results, too, as far as it kind of depends what's in their database and what information you're plugging in or providing to that database to match you up with different sources. So anyway. So we've talked a little bit about this. You know, um, the first item over here, creating a por portfolio and saving everything you have, right? If one scholarship application is asking for an essay, well, definitely save that because maybe you can use that same essay and tweak it, modify it, uh, tailor it to the scholarship donor who you're applying to, right? You want to talk about what their... Uh, organization is all about speak to them and tie in your interest and see how you mesh up because you want you're selling yourself to them so um, take the time to do that definitely if you have essays ask somebody to proofread it um, moms dads friends high school teachers um, we're, we're here to give feedback on that those things um, definitely proofread no spelling errors right um, social media checkup um, it just, I don't know, it goes without saying, maybe, I don't know, but they might check in to social media and say, who is this person? So be mindful of how you represent yourself online, because if it's not a scholarship donor, it's eventually going to be an employer who might be checking out your sh social media profile. So resources, great places over there to check, check out. Um, I just saw one of the posts not too long ago from MHS counselors, you know, showing you exactly where to go online here, how to find the scholarship resources. So check out that. So completing the FAFSA. Let's see. Okay. So here's just a screenshot of what the FAFSA looks like. So it's just um, the website for that is studentaid.gov. Um, over the past couple of years, the Department of Ed finally got with it and figured out that having like a bazillion different websites to do specific little things was not so great. So they finally consolidated everything to one website. So you just have to know studentaid.gov and you can do pretty much everything. Um, so here's where you would complete the FAFSA. Um, as a, n a new student completing the FAFSA, of course you're going to hit you know, new to the FAFSA, start it here. Um, but in your subsequent years, you can maybe come back and say, yep, I'm a returning uh, user, and they can just, you don't have to enter as much in there. One of the first things that, um, wait, I need to talk about this slide first. <laughs> um, so the FAFSA, what it's calculating, once you enter in um, all this bio demo, um, financial information, Essentially what it's calculating is an index, uh, that index being the expected family contribution. Um, that's uh, the value each school uh, uses to determine your eligibility for different types of financial aid. Um, of course, completing it online, you're going to have a lot of um, ways where, you know, skip logic can be employed, where you don't have to answer a certain question because you answered this one this way, so you get to skip a whole section or, you know, helpful hints along the way. Um, the FAFSA just opened up this past October 1st, right? You all have heard that date probably. The is open, go fill it out. Okay, how many of you have already done this step? Look at you. And that's why you're here tonight, is because you've already got this done. You guys are the overachievers. Good job. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And so um, the FAFSAs, you may have already received some of the results back from the FAFSA, letting you know what that EFC is. Um, so the schools that you list on the FAFSA, uh, and again, you can list up to 10 different schools on that first go through. So if you're considering a lot of different schools, 
No problem. The FAFSA allows you to list up to 10 the first time. And if you're considering 12, 15 other <laughs> more schools, you would just go back to the FAFSA, do a correction and add some additional schools. Or conversely, maybe you fill out the FAFSA, you list two schools, and then you're like, oh wait, I, wanna, I want this school to also receive the results. You would just go back, make a correction, and add that school to receive the FAFSA. So the FAFSA is using uh, income data from two years ago. So the FAFSA right now is actually using your tax data from 2020. No, is that right? 2020? It's on my slide, right? I'll, I'll listen to the slide. Um, so you're completing, nope, you're gonna be using 20, 2021. The current year is using 2020. Um, so, you'll be attending in 2023-24, so you're going to be using your tax information from 2021. So, you may be thinking, well, that's already a little bit ago, maybe things have changed. Um, we'll talk more about that in a, a little bit, but definitely talk to your school. Have that relationship with your financial aid office. And then, one thing at the bottom of the slide, just to point out, you are completing the FAFSA um, in, in the last year before some pretty major changes are gonna happen. So you may see, as high school seniors right now, your freshman year, the FAFSA results come back one way. I would say fill the FAFSA out again your sophomore year, just because all these big changes that are happening. So um, they passed a law, it was, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020-21. Um, basically, it was FAFSA simplification. They want to make it easier, the government, and so there's big changes that are happening. So um, more students may qualify for Pell Grant, um, other things, so um, big, big changes. So before you begin your FAFSA, each of you, I know, already went out there and you applied for and set up your FSA ID or your username and password. So this is one of the first things you have to do. Um, both the student and the parent would need to have their own FSA ID. Um, because this is you logging into the FAFSA, you applying your electronic signature on the FAFSA. So this is the way you're electronically signing it, is through your FSA ID. Again, same website, right? Studentaid.gov. Um, and then if, if by chance you're a parent and you're, you had your own FSA ID from when you were a student several years ago, that FSA ID may, may work again for this this go around with your student. One of the great things they added to the FAFSA a few years ago was um, the IRS data retrieval tool. Um, thank you, we finally have something that makes this even a little bit easier. Um, that's where you can, uh, once you're in the FAFSA, you can, you can elect to have your tax information, so from 2021, just automatically imported into the FAFSA. Um, that way you don't have to enter as much financial information, it'll just pull over all of that straight from the IRS. Um, it's a way to make sure, you know, the right numbers are on the form where they need to be. On the, on the FAFSA, you'll see when you do that import, it'll be labeled transferred from the IRS, so you won't see the actual number and that's just a way to protect your financial uh, information to just with hackers who get information so it's just a way to protect your information more and so here's just a screenshot of what that would look like when when you're within the FAFSA you would be prompted and asked do you want your tax information uh, sent to the FAFSA. So you just check the box and say, yep, transfer it now, and it'll come on over. We've talked a little bit about signatures, so both the student and the parent would need to sign the FAFSA to have that fully processed. So now that you've completed the FAFSA, um, and maybe you've already heard back from the FAFSA what your, the results are, um, 
It would tell you what your expected family contribution is. We use that to award Pell Grant as well as other types of financial aid. Um, so those different things go into the com computation for the, the EFC. Um, one question I always get from parents is, okay, what's that magical threshold, right? Where, where is it that once I earn this much, I might as well not even apply, right? That's what you want to know. What, what's that magical threshold? And, and it's really too hard to say right now how they determine your EFC right now because there's a lot of variables that go into determining your, your EFC. Um, right now, looking at the number in your household, right? If you're a family size of four or if you're a family size of eight, Having a total income of 80,000 is, is very different just based on your household size, right? Um, so things like that go, come into play. Um, right now, even um, the age of the oldest parent comes into play just because they know as a parent, the closer you're getting to retirement, you're trying to save more there. So that also can influence the EFC. So there's a lot of different variables. So unfortunately, there's no like magic cutoff. Um, my recommendation is just try it, see what happens, and, and decide after that. Certainly, um, you want to put your name in the hat, right? So and to do that is completing the FAFSA. That way you're considered for all the different types and sources of financial aid that we've already talked about. So definitely completing it, um, you want to do. So let's talk a little bit about cost of attendance. So here's where all these things kind of come together. Uh, once you complete the FAFSA, okay, great, what, what's happening now? Um, so the cost of attendance is that starting point. Uh, and of course, different things go into the cost of attendance, tuition and fees, of course, room and board, books and supplies, uh, transportation to get to school and back comes into play. And then just miscellaneous expenses. So all of those things comprise of and make up your cost of attendance. Um, you should be able to go to any school that you're considering, and you should be able to see information about the cost of attendance. So you can get an idea what the cost of attendance would be at the schools that you're considering. Um, but other things, so those are the normal things that are included, but other things can also be included in cost of attendance. So if in your sophomore, junior year, you're considering maybe studying abroad, that's a different cost. We can certainly adjust your cost to reflect maybe what you're, you're more actually paying. Uh, and then the very bottom bullet is important to note that um, cost of attendance, um, they can obviously, they differ from institution to institution. Um, just think about the different types of institutions, right? If you have state schools, kind of a maybe middle of the road cost of attendance, but then you have private schools or out of state schools, gonna be a higher cost, right? Your tuition's gonna be higher more than likely. Maybe transportation, they factor that in and make it, if you're traveling out of state, maybe your transportation's a little higher. Uh, and then compared to a community college or a technical school, cost of attendance probably lower there. Um, so the reason why that's important is it all plays into financial need. Um, so the starting point is the cost of attendance. And from there, we take the EFC and we subtract it. And that's how you come up with financial need. There's the mystery, it's uncovered. What is financial need? That's, that's defined right here. Um, so the EFC plays a part, they all kind of work together. So graphically, right, we all want a visual. How does this all pull together? Like we talked about the different schools, type schools, one, two, and three, one being like your out of state, your higher cost schools, the EFC, stays the same wherever you go, doesn't change. But at the end, the need is different, right? From school three, where you have very low need because your overall costs were lower, compared to school one, where your costs are higher, so your need is greater. So that kind of helps you picture how, how need plays into things, or how your EFC impacts your need. So we alluded to the changes that are coming to the FAFSA. So here's just a few of these things. So 
EFC, you're learning it one year and you can throw it away. It's going away. They're renaming the EFC to be the SAI, right? We have more acronyms. So SAI is just the Student Aid Index. It just kind of describes it a little bit different. It's just an index value that we use to determine your financial aid. Um, the, I think what this second bullet means is that the IRS DRT gets better. At least that's what I'm hoping for. They're going to have it called the Direct Data Exchange. Um, child support. Um, is one of those things that is asked on the FAFSA. It's now going to move from being considered untaxed income to being considered an asset. This is a good shift. It actually helps uh, your EFC be lower. So that's a good shift. Um, and then if you happen to own a small business or a family farm, here's kind of a big change. We might see some big impact here for families who fall into that category. And then the last bullet, is going to hit us, hit the families who have multiple kids in school maybe a little bit harder. They're no longer going to ask about how many kids do you have in school. Um, right now, it does. In the future, it's not. Um, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Oh, right now. <laughs> um, so special circumstances. So the FAFSA when you complete it. It's pretty black and white, right? What's this number? What's that number? It's not asking about, and what else is going on in your family that might be impacting your family? Um, because life does happen. And so here's where conversations with your financial aid administrator, your financial aid advisor, really are important because that's where you want to have a conversation and say, well, yes, my taxes say this from 2021, but let me tell you how whatever's happening right now in 2022 or even next year in 2023, maybe big things shift. Um, maybe a job change, a job loss, something happens. Maybe there's high medical bills that you're paying out of pocket. Um, even, even the change to the FAFSA that we're going to have in a couple years, I'm pretty sure that that will probably be something we throw into this category here where I have multiple um, students in college can you make an adjustment? Or, so that would be something that we can um, maybe consider there. So I think that's it. So, um, so some of the takeaway from tonight is definitely stay organized. Know your school's different priority dates for each stage. You know, what's the priority date for admissions? What's the priority date for completing scholarships? What about the FAFSA? So many dates. You don't want to miss those target dates because you want to make sure you can maximize your different financial aid options. Um, so making, meeting those dates is, is really important. So um, anyway, I'd be glad to field any questions that you might have. Um, feel free to ask away. Yes. Can this class get any chance of getting student loan forgiveness? Um, so the question is, can this class, so would they qualify for the student loan forgiveness? Um, you've probably heard this in the news recently uh, where uh, President Biden has, um, it, what's the word? Anyway, have student loan forgiveness, um, 10,000 or up to 20,000 if you're a Pell Grant recipient. So right now you would have had to have borrowed a loan prior to July 1st of this year. So at this time, no, unless something changes and there's some new, okay, now these borrowers. So at this point, so if, if, if you're a borrower, you may want to check into, can you receive any student loan forgiveness? But this class, not at this point because they haven't borrowed a student loan before July 1st of 2022. So good question. Yes. So if I've already gotten the like letter in the mail from K-State being like, this is how much you got in scholarship money, it, is it possible to get more from the school? Yes. So the question is, um, she's already received her scholarship offer from K-State. And she's asking, is it possible to receive more in scholarships uh, from K-State? And this could be the same at any institution. Um, yes. Um, 
a couple of things. Like we talked about earlier, just if your test scores or GPA would change, that could potentially increase the, the central award, like the, the scholarship offer that you received. But you could also be considered, you could be hearing, last year it was February, I don't know if it's going to be any earlier at K-State, but um, you could hear from your college and department some scholarships that they're, they're offering as an incoming student. So, yes, you could, you could be hearing, uh, having some additional scholarships from K-State. Yep. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Not necessarily. Um, I would definitely do the KSN application. So the question is, would, would you hear about that um, additional scholarships from the colleges and departments only if you do KSN? Um, and so not necessarily. Um, they're, they're also, they have access to the same information um, from your admissions application. And so they're looking at those things specifically. But, so you could hear like that first round, but then maybe you might get even another scholarship later that might be more through KSN. So, no stone unturned, right? <laughs> Uncover them all. Are there, are there any um, requirements tied to the, the scholarships the schools give out? So, are there any academic requirements, um, being a full-time student versus a partial student? Is this a, a question plant? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so he's asking, like, are there any requirements tied to the scholarship? Um, and for the scholarships that you're hearing about from K-State, and then check with the other institutions that you may be hearing from, like if there's any renewal criteria attached to that. For instance, at K-State, uh, for that scholarship to renew for your sophomore, junior, senior year, uh, you would need to have uh, a cumulative K-State GPA of 3.0 or greater, and then you need to complete as well at least 12 credit hours each semester or 24 credit hours in an academic year. So, and 12 hours is considered full-time. Um, so, yes, those things come into to play. So definitely check to see uh, what the requirements are at your school you're considering. Mm -hmm. We look at total for the year. So if you bomb the first semester, they have a good second semester. As far as the GPA, so but you would still need to complete 24 credit hours in the academic, complete successfully. It's still a pass, right? But then if you can bump up the GPA. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's not going to happen right there, though. <laughs> okay, a few party. Um, just something to kind of piggyback is make sure once you decide on an institution that you're going to, ask. Call and ask and talk to the financial aid office. You never know unless you're going to ask. So if let's say you're a couple thousand dollars short of being able to go to that college, ask. Um, can you help me find this? Um, our family, we can pay this much, but I we're short. Um, is there anything that you can do that we can where there's money that hasn't been accounted for. It, the worst they can say is no. There has been situations where it's happened, so I encourage you to ask. Stay in touch with your financial aid office at whatever institution you end up at. And then two other things. If you're a student, seniors, we have updated your Canvas page. So if you go to your advice, senior advisory page, and then at the bottom it says counseling, um, you have access to the volunteer hours, your scholarships are there, um, the, our emails are there, the email for to get your transcripts is there. All is kind of the hub of information. So that seniors have access to that. Parents, on the other side, if you go to the Manhattan High School counseling page, um, all the same information is available there. The scholarships are updated um, as often as we're getting them. Most of them are um, like our local scholarships, so I encourage you to use those search engines. But as soon as we get them, they're updated, and it's um, by months. You can see that it's mm -hmm. already been, some of them have already been crossed out. So we do our best to kind of push that out. But um, 
you also have to kind of keep track of things. I have a scholarship um, and an application tracker that I can send you if you ask. I just don't want to send it out to everybody because it's a Google form and then it gets kind of messy. So I, um, we're working on senior meetings. Um, so we're pulling in kids. We're starting with our December graduates. But we definitely are not afraid to answer emails. So um, we appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so very much. It was yes, great information. Absolutely. So okay. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.